Welcome to Cambridge Forum, discussing the secret life of Emily Dickinson. I'm Jamie Paglia, Program Manager of the Forum. This season marks 36 years that Cambridge Forum has been bringing you live public programs for the discussion of the issues and ideas that are shaping our world. One of America's most enigmatic poets, Emily Dickinson lived a deeply private life that has remained in many respects a mystery. The reclusive writer kept two-thirds of nearly 1,800 poems from the public view and was notoriously protective of her personal correspondence and relationships. In My Wars Are Laid Away in Books, The Life of Emily Dickinson, biographer Alfred Habiger explores her ties with family, contemporaries, suitors, and friends, offering a rare glimpse of the powerful personality behind one of the most complex minds in American letters. Alfred Habiger is the author of an acclaimed biography and scholar of Henry James and a biography of Henry James Sr., uh, an unusual person in his own right, the former University of Kansas English professor and Fulbright scholar, lives and writes in a log house he built with his wife in northeastern Oregon. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Alfred Habiger. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I'll simply launch into a few remarks and then see where it goes. Somewhere or other, Henry James, in, in one of his uh, literary essays, has a remark about the seam between the life and the work. It's a, uh, it's a phrase describing uh, the relationship between uh, some authors' uh, life and work, and it's a phrase I like. Uh, that metaphor of the seam is very useful. It reminds us of two things at the same time, that the life and the work are really quite distinct and that there's also a connection between them of some sort. It's often very hard to describe. A seam joins, but it also marks a discontinuity. And for me, that, that uh, uh, figure of speech points, in a way, to the writer's individual imagination, uh, the imagination that uh, emerges from a life, but that builds something uh, very far beyond it. Imagination, uh, the individual imagination of a writer, often involves fantasy. Uh, by that I mean fantasizing, fantasizing, daydreaming, dissatisfactions with a life, uh, a quest for an alternative, uh, a desire, a uh, search for pleasure, all of those things reflecting uh, the background of the life, but at the same time, the imagination points to something that we again and again use the word art for, or timelessness, or universal, all terms perhaps discredited in some ways, but still often indispensable. Uh, I think it it's useful for a biographer to keep some idea of the seam in mind. It helps prevent two very different kinds of errors. A naive biographer may want to equate the life uh, with the art in some sense, uh, to see passages from the work as somehow transcripts uh, from the life, uh, which they never are. Uh, but the second mistake is, uh, is very different. It's a mistake that some very, uh, very eminent critics tend to make, in my opinion. Uh, and that is to see the literature as entirely removed from the detail, uh, the context of a life. Uh, it's possible for such critics to make literature into an affair among works of literature exclusively. Uh, and with uh, Dickinson uh, critics in particular, there has been a tendency among a few or some uh, to, uh, to try to understand the poems quite apart from her life. One of the biggest mistakes that uh, has, has been made, it seems to me, is to conflate the poems from different periods, to bring them together, to discuss them uh, without a recognition of the uh, chron chronology behind them, the uh, temporal basis for many of her poems. Uh, Dickinson's unusual, perhaps unique, in the sense that 
we don't know whether she really intended to publish. Certainly during her life, there's no evidence she wanted her work put in print and distributed. Um, there's no evidence at all, and the evidence all points the other way. About 10 of her poems, as far as we know at present, saw print during her lifetime, all of them in newspapers, and one of those also in a volume of anonymous verse. There's no evidence she favored any of that, and the evidence for her attitude towards publication after her death is also mixed and complicated. I'll say a little bit about that later. In any case, the scene. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we read or write biographies uh, is that we're looking for that scene. Uh, ordinarily, when we read a biography of a writer, it's one we already know, a writer we already know. Uh, we already have the special interest. Uh, we may have a huge admiration, or we may feel a special aversion. This happens, too, and is, and is a motive. Uh, at any rate, we, we want to know more. We're curious. What sort of life does the uh, work grow out of? Uh, what's the scene? What's the connection between that writer's imagination? Uh, that is, what's the connection between the work and the life? Uh, that generates that imagination. As far as I know, Emily Dickinson uh, did not have a special interest in biography. But in 1853, uh, when she was 52, and this would have been three years before her death, uh, the first biographies of George Eliot and Emily Bronte uh, appeared in print in the United States. That was 1883. Um, and uh, Emily Dickinson was intensely interested. She looked forward uh, to Cross's biography uh, of George Eliot, and uh, soon after uh, Agnes Mary F. Robinson's Life of Emily Bronte appeared, within a month, uh, Dickinson had read it. Uh, I don't want to take the time to talk about her reactions to the uh, George Eliot biography that she read by Matilda Blind, uh, but I do want to say something about her reactions to Robinson's biography of Emily Bronte. Uh, at the time, uh, of course, Dickinson had, had read uh, Bronte's poems, uh, and she was also a huge admirer of uh, Charlotte Bronte. Uh, there's an earlier letter of Dickinson's before this biography by Robinson appeared that has a statement about, quote, gigantic Emily Bronte, of whom her Charlotte said, full of Ruth for others, on herself she had no mercy. Gigantic. This idea of giants, uh, giant writers, uh, giant people, runs through some of Dickinson's work. And uh, there are poems uh, that suggest uh, she may at one point have thought of herself in some such terms. So one of the questions that interested me when I really started to focus uh, on Dickinson's reading of the life of Emily Bronte was how she read it. Did she read this as an admirer, which of course she was, or as a peer, as someone who in some sense was in the same class as the uh, subject of the biography? And one of the reasons I wanted to know the answer to that was that the question of how Dickinson viewed her own, her own uh, work as poet in the years shortly before her death is very difficult to answer. Earlier in her life, there is some evidence. Uh, about 1863, according to Ralph Franklin's dating, which, uh, which I generally follow, uh, 
uh, she wrote the poem, This is My Letter to the World, which I'm, which I'm sure some of you know. This is my letter to the world. And by the way, this is the poem from Habegger's memory, and so it's not going to be quite right. Uh, this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me the news that nature told to me with tender majesty. The gentle news? The gentle news? Something, something <laughs> with tender majesty. Her message is uh, put out to hands I cannot see. Uh, and then the last two lines say, in effect, please, oh, do we have it? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Great. Start over. <laughs> this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me, the simple news that nature told with tender majesty. Her message is committed to hands I cannot see. For love of her, sweet countrymen, judge tenderly of me. That's Dickinson writing about 1863 in her manuscript books. She never sent that poem to anybody, uh, as far as we know. And when her poems were first brought out uh, four years after her death, this poem was taken as the preface before the first numbered page, as if this was the author speaking to the reader and explaining her real purpose in writing. But there are several problems with looking at the poem uh, in that way. Uh, there are no other poems that make any such statement. Dickinson was much more than a poet of nature, furthermore. Uh, and there are lots of poems that speak with scorn of the quest for fame. For her last 15 or so years, she did not organize her work. And at her death uh, in 1886, her poems were, uh, except for those in the manuscript books, were highly disorganized. Many survived on scraps. So the question is, how did she look on her career, if that's the word, as poet in her last years? And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to know how she reacted to the life of uh, Emily Bronte. How did Emily Dickinson look at her own achievement? Um, and so with that, I want to turn very briefly to uh, some of the things that I got out of Robinson's life of Bronte, and then turn to Dickinson's very brief remarks. The book, the biography by Robinson of Emily Bronte, was intuitive and highly dramatic. Uh, and, and based on some very special research that no one else was able to duplicate afterward. The book was full of details, insights, claims that must have connected for Emily Dickinson. Bronte's motherlessness, attachment to home, elusiveness with strangers, her powers of self-disciplined labor, her housewifely skills, her indulgence of Branwell, her thorny brilliance, her upright purity, but also her bold treatment of passion. There was the large dog she loved, the Calvinism she both abandoned and transformed, the uncanny imaginative power that transmuted, in Robinson's phrase, the my, myriest, this is the superlative of myri, uh, myriest earth of common life. And here are a few sentences from Robinson. If the butcher's boy came to the kitchen door, Emily Bronte would be off like a bird. Kindness and thought for others were part of the nature of this unsocial, rugged woman. She made the bread 
and her bread was famous in Hayworth. But what was this? What was all this, if not a distorted image of Emily Dickinson? In a letter to her friend, Elizabeth Holland, Dickinson pronounced the book, quote, more electric by far, more electric far than anything since Jane Eyre. She read Jane Eyre in the winter of 1849-50. So allowing for a bit of exaggeration, she's still saying this is the most electrifying book she's read in the last quarter century. She called Bronte the, quote, Napoleon of the Cross, a phrase that I think grounds that writer's grandeur in the mastery of pain, the Napoleon of the Cross. And finally, Dickinson insisted that her friend Elizabeth, uh, whose husband, a writer, had recently died, uh, insisted that Elizabeth read the book. And here's Dickinson making her recommendation. It is so strange a strength, I must have you possess it. The book is so strange a strength, I must have you possess it. What is it? Possess what? Perhaps the book, but also perhaps the strength. Like so many of Dickinson's statements, this can be read in multiple ways. I think she's urging Elizabeth to read the book in order to regain a kind of strength herself. But fundamentally, I think the poet is saying uh, this biography gives us a picture of so strange a strength that I want you to understand that. Well, this is a command. And I think I'm right in saying that nothing at least I settled in my biography, <laughs> nothing Dickinson ever read was recommended with more force than was this biography, which effectively validated her idea of power based in weakness. And yet, we can only surmise what the book said to her about her own strange strength as a poet a point on which she was silent. The electric new possession was to be shared, not hugged in private. True greatness makes no claims for itself. On itself and on us readers and biographers, it had no mercy. It's customary for a great master like Emily Dickinson at the end of life to expect some sort of reciprocal or some sort of recognition from the reader. Some writers nod at the pantheon uh, as if to suggest where their own urn should be placed after their death. Or they leave a collected edition. Uh, or they expect some sort of uh, appropriate recognition of what they have done. This is one of the mysteries of Emily Dickinson. I don't think she ever did those things, as far as I can tell. Uh, and, what, and the fact that she didn't, it seems to me, tells us something about the seam between her life uh, and her work, uh, about her imagination. It's an imagination uh, that's in a very different class from anyone else's. It didn't involve recognition. It had the idea of privacy deeply wrapped up in it in ways we can't quite understand. Uh, and finally, I'm afraid this is one of the mysteries that I can't really feel confident I understand. Uh, this is a writer who, uh, whose secrets, uh, some of whose secrets can be known uh, but whose most important secret, how did she look on her own mastery, uh, cannot. You are joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Alfred Habiger discussing the secret life of Emily Dickinson. To follow up on that, um, you spend some time in your book talking about
Emily's family history, her uh, her parents, her grandparents, and in particular, in regards to how she viewed her own writing and and her reading, the fact that her father, who was very conflicted about um, whether a woman should be educated at all, but at the same time had a habit of buying her books and to a degree urging her not to read them. Um, did this sort of, in your opinion, from what you have gathered, did this affect how she wrote, why she wrote? Was it that same conflict? I'm writing, but I'm not supposed to be putting this out to the world because of the place that I should be having as a, as a woman in society. Is that something that was handed down to her from her father, do you think? Well, I do. Uh, as with so many other questions, the answers to this uh, are, are not obvious and uh, can easily be contested. Her father had some very strong opinions on women's, uh, women's place in the world. As a, as a young man uh, in college, he participated in a debate uh, on the question whether uh, woman's intellectual powers were the equivalent of man's. Uh, this was a debate at uh, Amherst College. And uh, in it, uh, and, and the transcript survives, interestingly, at, uh, here in uh, Cambridge in the Houghton Library. In it, uh, Edward, Emily's father, maintained the negative and maintained it very fiercely. Uh, it's, a, it's a ferocious argument he puts up uh, that uh, women uh, uh, do not have the mind that men do and uh, are not capable of the same intellectual achievements. He was very explicit on that point and uh, when pressed, he became quite irrational. Uh, he defended that idea elsewhere. Curiously enough, when he was courting Emily Norcross, later Dickinson, uh, in 1827, he brought out a series of papers in Amherst's first newspaper uh, on the proper education of women, uh, a series of papers, and he worked out some of the same ideas, among other things, making it clear that in his opinion, a woman who became a published author automatically excluded herself from uh, ordinary society. She would not be a wife. She would not be a mother. Um, question is, did he hold these opinions and were they felt in the Dickinson household? After all, this, these were the writings of a young man who hadn't been married as yet. I think the answer to that question is provided by something that Dickinson wrote his son Austin in 1874, the year of his death, when there was an open hearing uh, at the State House in Boston on the female suffrage issue, an open hearing by a legislative committee. People like Julia Ward Howe testified and a number of others. Afterward, uh, Edward wrote home to Austin saying that he had stepped in, he'd listened to the speakers, uh, and he hoped that once the legislature itself started considering the question, it would settle it once and for all, once the scum was cleared off. And that word scum applies to the speakers. Well, so the evidence is slim, but it looks to me as if Emily Dickinson's father retained that ferocity of judgment on this, on this particular issue. Uh, and I think it was partly because of that, finally getting back to your question, that uh, it would have been very hard for Emily Dickinson to become a publishing poet. Uh, we don't have any written evidence and letters, uh, but I have a very strong suspicion, which I mentioned in the book, that when her prose composition, a very extravagant valentine, was published in an Amherst College paper in spring of 1850, when she was 19 years old, I have a very strong suspicion that her father made her feel that this was an inappropriate thing for her to have written and to have brought out. 
There are passages in some of her letters to her good friends, Jane Humphrey in particular, of the time that suggest something of that sort may have happened. In any case, I think Dickinson understood she could not publish. Uh, now, I don't want to give the impression that there's clear evidence of this or that she didn't also find that privacy uh, wasn't congenial. It, it was very congenial to her. She was a, a, a deeply private, reclusive person, and for whatever reason, uh, fully uh, turned against the idea of publication. Publication was not something she wanted once she became a committed poet. Uh, and it would be a mistake, I think, to see her as some kind of victim of her father. I think she accepted his rules, she learned to live within them, and that it was living within them that partly made Emily Dickinson the writer she was, the person she was, uh, and that partly uh, helps us understand that strange seam between her life and her work. You are listening to Alfred Habiger discussing The Secret Life of Emily Dickinson. The floor is now open to the audience. Please use the microphone. Just please go ahead and line up at the microphone if you have a question or a comment. Thanks. I've always wondered why her father insisted she not go back for her second year at Mount Holyoke. Uh, I think that he thought her health was worrisome or something of that sort. I wonder if it had anything to do with his attitude toward the education of women. Um, also, one of the interesting things that I've always thought of, I think it's true to say that of the 10 poems that were published, I don't think anyone was, any one of them was published as she had written it. I think mm. that editors changed it. I often wonder if she was extremely offended by that, and understandably so. Uh, my question really to you is, I, I did a thesis on Emily Dickinson at Boston College about 30 years ago, particularly on biblical imagery in her poetry, and more specifically still, the Book of Revelation of St. John the Divine. And so naturally I think about her and had that in mind as I was reading through the corpus many times. But um, now and again I come across even formidable critics who seem to intimate that Emily was an atheist, and uh, I must say I, uh, I totally disagree with that. Uh, I really think the woman had a mystical relationship with God. I think there was a mystical marriage there. I think that explains the white robes and other kinds of things. And as I hear her reflect on faith and prayer and God and the afterlife, uh, I think she had a very lively faith. I said in the conclusion of this that I thought she was the first God is dead theologian, not that God was literally dead for her, but the God being proclaimed in the Amherst Congo Church was dead. Yeah, I particularly love her poem, um, uh, the Bible is an antique volume written by faded men at the suggestion. So, had but the tale a wobbling teller, all the boys would come. Orpheus' sermon captivated, it did not condemn. I think she wrote that because her nephew missed morning prayers at Amherst and uh, was in trouble. I'd love to know if you had time or care to comment on how you see her in the religious life of mid-19th century Amherst, a rather starchy neighborhood of Edwardsian revivalism. Good. Well, you've given me a lot to chew on, uh, and <laughs> I'll, I'll proceed. The second year, why didn't she go to uh, Mount Holyoke Female Seminary for a second year? Uh, someone, uh, some, some scholars have checked on that and, and checked on the, uh, on the enrollment of other students and found that actually most students only went for one year uh, at that time. Uh, it wasn't really a college yet. It didn't offer a bachelor's degree. It gave a certificate to, to students who had finished the three-year course uh, and wanted to become teachers, perhaps. Uh, but in fact, most students at that point in 1847-48 didn't plan to go for the uh, full uh, three-year period. And so in a way, Dickinson was following the usual uh, procedure. Also, judging from her letters, she did not herself want to go back for a second year. She was very homesick at first. Uh, she could have gone back as she qualified for all of this, the third year courses. Uh, she did very well. Uh, she, was, she was tough and she put up with a lot there, but uh, she probably could have endured another year. 
Her letters, though, suggest that she was very relieved to go back home. And so it's not at all certain that her father pulled her back, uh, by no means. We, we just don't know for sure. Certainly, it seems to have, the decision to go home seems to have agreed with her very much. Uh, your, your second point, I think, involved the publication of her poems. You pointed out that everything had been editorially altered somewhat. Uh, this is a question that has been argued quite vigorously in the last few years by uh, Dickinson scholars, a number of whom have suggested that one of the reasons, perhaps the primary reason she was averse to publishing, was that she conceived of her manuscript uh, version of her poems as the only acceptable one, that she wanted her lineation, her broken lines, her spelling, her punctuation, or non-punctuation as you choose to regard it, uh, her, her, her famous uh, dashes, if that's the right term for them. That's a controversy in itself. But um, we don't need to pause over that. Well, there's only one letter of hers, actually, that comments on the editorial liberties taken with a poem. Uh, and that, uh, that's in, I think, early 1866 or in 1865 for the, uh, uh, the snake poem, A Narrow Fellow in the Grass. And in that comment, she objects to the way the, th the third and fourth th uh, punctuation mark, a question mark, was inserted between the third and fourth line. She wanted a third line to run on to the fourth. Uh, it has a, there's a question mark that's inserted, and it does make a difference. Uh, and in fact, I think I would like to read those first few lines to show you why this was uh, an important point for her. It, she wasn't simply being finicky in this case. Uh, what she had to say did have something to do with the meaning that she intended. Here's how the poem was printed uh, punctuated in the Springfield Republican. A narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. You may have met him. Did you not? There's our emphatic question mark. His notice instant is. You may have met him. Did you not? His notice instant is. Uh, the, the snake surprises you. It comes upon you suddenly. He doesn't make a polite warning. His notice is instant. Well, what she wrote in manuscript was, uh, you may have met him. Did you not his notice sudden is? She also used the word instant in another version. Uh, Did you not his notice sudden is? sudden is? Well, I think she's trying to capture the suddenness, the instantness, the uh, instantaneousness uh, of the encounter. Uh, and for that reason, she objected to the uh, question mark. But it's interesting. That's all she objected to. She, ex she accepted that this was lines, these, these were lines three and four. If you look at her manuscript, you see that they were lines four or five or five and six, depending on which version, which manuscript version of the poem she's using, uh, you're using. So... Uh, I have, the, I have a very strong feeling that uh, it wasn't simply the alteration of her lineation or the substitution of standard punctuation marks for her dashes. We don't really have good evidence that she objected to such things. It was the insertion of a standard punctuation mark that altered meaning. Even more than that, she objected to the publicity and to the theft. Uh, she she uh, refers to it in that sense, the, the unauthorized publication of this poem. But then finally, the, the big question, uh, her, her attitude towards religion. Um, no, Emily Dickinson was not an atheist. The difficulty, though, in talking about her religious views is that she abandoned the whole idea of doctrinal definition of religion. She simply gave up that idea. The abstract, propositional, creedal statement 
of what you believe. Uh, and there's a lot to say about that. In the 1850s, when many of her views crystallized, uh, there was a controversy between, uh, between two groups of, of Orthodox Trinitarian Christians. Uh, the, the, the old line Calvinists, uh, who, who per, perhaps most strongly represented at Princeton Theological Seminary, and another group uh, for whom the spokesman was uh, Edwards Amasa Park here in New England, associated with uh, Andover Theological Seminary. One of Park's most important ideas was that there's a distinction between the theology of the feelings and the theology of, what's the rest of it, of, of the mind, of the, of the intellect. I think, it, I think his word was the intellect. The theology of the feelings, the theology of the intellect. Uh, and what Dickinson basically gave up was the whole idea of the theology of the intellect. Uh, in other words, the idea that uh, religious belief can in some way be divine, de defined uh, by propositional language. Poetry for her, as for some others, became the only proper uh, way to articulate religious views. Uh, I think this became a fundamental idea with her. And uh, one result of that is uh, it's hard to say exactly what she believed. I myself questioned whether she can be considered a mystic in a traditional sense. Uh, she came out of Calvinist evangelicalism. And a lot of that remained within her very, very strongly. Uh, she was not, a, not an Ed Edwardsian by any means. Uh, the nature of true virtue, Jonathan Edwards, is difficult for me to connect with Emily Dickinson. Uh, and I have my doubts that whether she felt uh, any kind of mystical identification with Christ or regarded herself as having entered a mystical marriage. Uh, I don't read her poems that way. I think there's very good evidence that in, the, in a number of poems from 1862 to 1865, she was thinking about a particular man, a very earthly man, uh, and that uh, she had a fixation on this person uh, that she gradually grew out of. Uh, if one takes those poems seriously, it looks to me uh, as if this was a romantic attachment uh, that played a very strong part in her life. She definitely felt rejected, abandoned, and had to accommodate herself to that. I think the evidence is there. The question is how exactly one interprets those poems, how you read them. One can't read them literally. You have to, I think, allow for the imaginative uh, alteration of her circumstances. Again and again, she does play a part, but again and again, she is also making a statement about her own life. I want to come back to that later, perhaps. Another question? There's, there seems to be no lack of questions. Uh -huh. More questions than there are answers about Emily Dickinson's life, areas of puzzlement, of ambiguity. Uh, could you help us to understand what it is about her life and her poetry that speaks most forcefully to you and why her poems speak to us today as they do? That's Sure. Uh, uh, my, my task uh, is to explain uh, why her poems speak to us today uh, and, and what is it in them that, that uh, most appeals to me. Is, is that the gist of it? Uh, that's such a hard question to answer, both of those. Uh, but I, th I come back to uh, the feeling that in her poems, she deals with fundamentals of human desire and grief, first of all. I think that, it's, that, that, that many of her poems are simply supreme expressions of unsatisfiable, desire, uh, of endless mourning, uh, and that uh, she puts such things across 
uh, in a way uh, that's far better than anyone else I know. Another part of the question, though, involves her sense of language, uh, which in some ways is absolutely superb and stands apart from everyone else. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that as a, as a uh, young girl, uh, she was regarded as a prodigy. In Amherst Academy, uh, her compositions were admired, uh, uh, hugely admired. There's a, there's a gift for uh, the imaginative use of language that's there from the start. Uh, and that, too, is part of uh, her appeal, that there is simply uh, a supreme command of the English language. Uh, Another thing I would say would be that the difficulty of her work is a source of appeal. Um, and a fourth would be that the sense of the person behind the poetry has a profound amount to do uh, with, with our response. Uh, she was packaged this way in 1890. There's that first poem I read earlier, This Is My Message to the World. Uh, her poems were interpreted from the start as those of a person. They were presented not simply as literary art, but as expressions, statements by a person uh, who is difficult to know. Uh, I think this is part of her appeal, that our sense of a personality, of a history behind the poems. Now, this is a little bit inadmissible. We, we don't like to say this often about the appeal of great artists, and yet that is very much a part of her appeal. There is a person there, uh, a woman. Uh, this is uh, something, this is an aspect of her, of her work that has been explored in the last 20 years uh, in some very interesting ways. Uh, she was a woman living in time, uh, and that factors in to our response to her poetry. Um, so I would say those four things uh, explain, and to some extent, they don't explain, but they help account for the appeal of this writer. Uh, her, her, her mastery of uh, masterful treatment of fundamental uh, human feelings and yearnings and predicaments, uh, desire and grief in particular, uh, her use of language, the mystery, and then finally, the fact that we can sense a person, a very interesting person, in back of those poems. These four things go a long way to, uh, to uh, uh, explaining her appeal, for me at least. Very interesting evening. I uh, wish I could quote the poem called Pain. Hmm. But from what I remember, his pain has an element of blank. Where it starts and where it ends, nobody knows. Something like that. Yeah. But getting back to your comment about the seam between her life and her work, I've always wondered whether she's talking about physical pain or emotional pain. Or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe there's lack of a, there's not a seam between her life and her work. We know she died of a kidney failure, Bright's disease, but I don't know whether she had much pain from her kidney failure or whether you know and whether, what you comment about her writing about pain, because it's a beautiful poem, one of our best. Sure. Um, I wonder, do you know, Peter, whether there's a copy of that particular poem in here? Could you find it very quickly? Oh, good. We, I'm, I'm not sure we have the entire poem, but. Thank you. Pain has an element of blank. It cannot recollect when it begun or if there were a time when it was not. It has no future but itself. Its infinite contain its past, enlightened to perceive new periods of pain. Uh, and, there, and there are some other good pain poems, too. There, there are a number, and I wish we could read them all and, and en enjoy the pain. But 
I would say, well, and, and, and in a way, enjoyment's not entirely inappropriate. What's her, one of, her poem about the beads of sweat appearing on the brow? I wish I could remember it exactly, but it almost suggests that this is her kind of pain. Uh, I don't want to imply that we're dealing with a sadistic or even masochistic writer, however. Uh, this is something very different. I think that uh, the pain that she has in mind in her poems would, would not be physical pain. It would be emotional. Uh, and, that, and that it probably has something to do with a kind of pain that she wrote about in her, some of her letters, and that Vinnie, her sister Lavinia, wrote about after her life. And that is the pain of losing a friend or the pain of having a friend die. Uh, the, the, friend, the pain of grief, the, the pain of abandonment by somebody close. Um, the word hurt shows up 21 times in uh, Emily Dickinson's poems as a noun or as a verb. And all of those, uh, all of those poems, according to Franklin's dating, were written from 1860 to 1863. Uh, for me, that's a very interesting statistic and very suggestive. And one of the things it suggests was that uh, her poems about pain have something to do with her life in those times, in particular, her romantic crisis, uh, which she got over. Uh, at the same time, it would be a huge mistake to say that this poem I just read is about that romantic crisis. That would be a serious mistake. Uh, there are many of her poems that do not require, it seems to me, any particular knowledge of her life for us to be able to understand and appreciate and see the greatness of that work. And there are other poems that cannot be understood apart from her life. Uh, this is not a writer who wrote for the public. She did not write with the idea that her poems should make sense to an unseen audience, uh, her sweet countrymen. One of the reasons why I deeply distrust that poem, this is my letter to the world, is that I know of very little evidence that Emily Dickinson regarded her fellow countrymen as sweet. In 1863, the year of the Battle of Gettysburg, for instance, it's well to remember that. Uh, we don't know for certain that she wrote the poem in, those, in that year, but according to Franklin, her handwriting in her manuscript book, making the one and only manuscript record of that poem, seems to date from 1863. Um, well, I'm coming back to, my, to that old conundrum of whether we need to know her life in order to read her poems, and I, I, without pretending to settle that, I'll simply repeat that there are a lot of poems that do not require any knowledge about her life. There are some who do, and there's some that do. And then there are, in addition, a lot of poems uh, that take on added meaning, it, seemed to, it seems to me, uh, if we put them in the context of the person uh, who actually produced them at a particular point. Will you tell us about some of the challenges you faced writing a biography of this very private person? Obviously, you've admitted you can't solve all of the mysteries, but how did you go about researching and preparing the biography? Does it get easier or harder to write a biography about somebody like Emily Dickinson as we move away from her actual lifetime? And yeah. how would you compare the resources you had and the, the demands on the biographer that we make today with those 19th century biographers situations, the people you quoted writing about George Eliot and Emily Bronte? Well, uh, again, that's a very, very good and rich question. Um, 
I think the challenge for a contemporary biographer writing about Emily Dickinson, the challenges are, are really very great. For one thing, we expect a biographer nowadays to talk about the sexual life of the subject. Uh, and this was an expectation I felt very uncomfortable with uh, and uh, basically shirked. Uh, I willingly shirked it, and I would defend my shirking of it. Uh, uh, I, I, I felt uneasy uh, reflecting on, uh, on such matters uh, with, with Emily Dickinson. Uh, her, so she, she has some very frank expressions of passion uh, in her poems. But after all, they're poems. Uh, and they're not uh, some transcript from a private journal. Uh, so that that was one problem that I had to think about, uh, and, uh, and and try to work out. One of the uh, ideas uh, about Dickinson that faced me from the start uh, is the is the belief uh, among some Dickinson scholars uh, that she was lesbian. This is uh, has been a very powerful reading of her work from time to time. And I don't think I'm distorting my motives too much if I say that when I went into this project, I had not made up my mind on that. Uh, I tried to f let the evidence direct me. And uh, without claiming to have succeeded, uh, I felt, I, I can say, that I felt uh, the evidence was not there. Uh, I was impressed by the passionate expression of attachment that we find in her letters to women. Uh, but I think that that was an expression of a kind of ardency of attachment uh, and an expression of the writer's generosity. Uh, she uh, has some of these passionate statements in letters to women she hardly knew or did not know very well. For instance, Mary Bowles, uh, the wife of Samuel Bowles. Uh, there's a poem that uh, Dickinson sent Mary Bowles that ends, Blue Sea, Take Me. Uh, and there are, uh, there, are, there are other examples of this. Well, how do you interpret that? This is a, a metaphor from nature. It's not socially contextualized. It can be interpreted in many ways. And in a way, that's my point, that uh, a lot of her uh, ardent letters to her early girlfriends or her grown women friends uh, are very similar to that in many ways. So this was a problem I had to struggle with. Uh, Another problem was that of uh, simply research. I, I was committed from the beginning of this biography to going back to uh, original sources wherever I could. I like doing that. Uh, I, I, I read my predecessor's footnotes very carefully. Uh, I explored a lot of primary sources, and I looked for new ones, and I was able to find some new ones. Uh, at Yale, for instance, in, uh, there, there is the printer's text of the 1894 edition of Emily Dickinson's letters. Uh, this is in the handwriting, mostly, of Mabel Loomis Todd. So I looked at that, and I found a number of passages that had been blue-penciled at the last minute. Uh, these were passages that uh, Todd had designed for the publisher, and at the last minute, someone, I think Austin Dickinson, Emily's brother, blue-penciled them. Now, by and large, these were perfectly innocuous passages, but they did, in general, have something to say about Dickinson family private life. There's a very nice story about, about Gilbert, the uh, nephew of Dickinson's, uh, a lovely little story that got blue-penciled at the last minute. And this was in line with her brother's uh, insistence that 
his own family's private life, not be exposed in any way. This was standard practice in the late 19th century. This was not unusual, uh, but it's one of the things I was able to find. I looked for a lot of other stuff. I, looked, I, I, I took very seriously the fact that Emily Dickinson's father was a lawyer and uh, an, an important, played an, uh, a fairly important role in, in public life uh, in his time. Uh, so I looked up his case, cor uh, case courses. I wanted to know what cases got appealed to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. I looked for such things. Uh, and I got a much clearer idea of the kind of lawyer he was um, and, and the way he operated in public life. Uh, I looked for uh, court cases that might reflect on Dickinson's private life, and I came up with a Norcross family lawsuit, a very bitter one, in 1857. This is a very interesting year for Emily Dickinson. 1857 looks like the one year uh, for which we don't have any letters from her. That is, once she began, uh, when, when, once, once she was uh, an adult. Uh, it's also the year before she began assembling her manuscript books in private. Uh, and it's the year before, perhaps, her first uh, draft to master. Uh, and uh, that, that really struck me. The Norcrosses were a very close clan, uh, and this was a very bitter lawsuit. Edward represented the losing side. One side of the family accused the other of withholding trust funds, uh, and they were all very close to Emily Dickinson's mother. Uh, this was fairly scandalous, and uh, evidence has been pretty well covered up. Uh, there's not a single reference to it in any surviving letter. Uh, so from that and from other things, I was, I was inclined to believe that uh, there, were, there, were, there were no great skeletons in Emily Dickinson's own closet uh, from that time, but that like many members of tight-knit families, she kept a tight lip about sensitive matters within her family. Uh, she was very much a member of the Dickinson clan, and she did not spill its secrets in public. Um, there's more I could, I could talk about my, my uh, I, I could say about my, my uh, research, but uh, that was, I, I'm, I'm one of the biographers who finds the primary research one of the most appealing and interesting things. It, it, it offers a chance for travel, uh, for one thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for uncovering something new. Uh, near, in, in her last few years, Emily Dickinson wrote a number of letters about the Reverend Charles Wadsworth, who I think was master. Uh, she wrote some 20 letters to some good friends of Charles Wadsworth's, and in those letters and elsewhere, she calls him my dearest earthly friend, my Philadelphia. This is after Wadsworth's death. Before his death, her lips were sealed on that subject, as far as we know. Soon after he dies, all of a sudden, we have many expressions of her attachment. Um, so I was very interested in Wadsworth. Uh, and I investigated his life uh, and found that his father had gone bankrupt when he was in his mid-teens. Uh, it was a complete bankruptcy. Even the father's clothes were auctioned. Uh, his mother remarried. It looks to me as if she had to remarry to support herself. Uh, young Charles, who was also a prodigy, uh, he published widely in newspapers before he was age 20. He went up to New York, upper New York State, was educated at a series of schools, uh, including White Town or Whitesboro, New York. So I went to the Utica Public Library to see what I could find. And I came up with a, uh, a, a, a publication from 1830 called The Record of Genius that had some of young Charles Wadsworth's poems in it. One of them uh, written uh, to a woman who has uh, inspired him with a faith in life once again. This poem is titled Two blank, blank, blank. And in the copy I found in the Utica Public Library, some early 19th century hand had written in three initials there. 
and given me an idea of who uh, that woman might have been. Uh, well, there's more. But adventures like that are, uh, are the sort of thing that biographers love. Uh, often they turn out to be uh, not conclusive in the end, unfortunately. Well, sort of to that end, I, I understand that there is a photograph uh, that a professor at UNC has uncovered that he believes is another more uh, uh, recent photograph of Emily Dickinson. Do you know of it, and do you have an opinion on, on its uh, validity? I know of it, and I have an opinion, but it's only an opinion. Uh, this photo was, uh, was bought on eBay by uh, Philip Gura for 400 and something dollars. On the back of it, uh, it has the name of uh, Emily Dickinson written. Emily Dickinson, um, and I can't remember what, what else is there, D, uh, December, uh, perhaps, uh, 1886. Uh, it shows an older woman, slightly older than what we see in the familiar daguerreotype of Emily Dickinson. And my opinion is that this is the Emily Dickinson. Um, I think it's the one. However, uh, proof has not been forthcoming. Uh, it's impossible to trace the provenance of this thing. Uh, if it were known to have, be, if it were known to be authentic, it would obviously be worth a great deal more uh, than four hundred dollars. The seller of this does not seem to have known that there was only one authenticated image of the poet, uh, and had no idea that uh, the figure that he should have asked should be a lot higher. Um, that was a dealer in bulk photos who had acquired it from another dealer in bulk photos. I myself don't think that fraud would have been involved for no more than $400. Uh, the fraudulent poem, for instance, by, uh, by a convict in uh, the Utah, in a penitentiary in Utah that surfaced a few years ago and that was passed off as by Emily Dickinson, had been acquired by the Jones Library in Amherst for, I think, 20,000. Uh, a short poem, uh, not a very good one, and, uh, and uh, not, not, in my opinion, uh, uh, one that looks like it could have been written by Dickinson. I, I have a good friend, a, a Dickinson scholar, who read this before the inauthenticity of that poem had been demonstrated, who said to me, she should have settled it publicly, but she said it privately. She said, this looks a little simplistic for Emily. And, uh, and she was right. That was Betty Bernhardt, who deserves credit for that shrewd judgment. Uh, that could be disproved. The evidence is not in, though, on this, uh, on this photo, on this second photo of Emily Dickinson. It shows a, uh, one of the reasons why I would like it to be uh, Dickinson is that it's a very composed image. It, it looks very intelligent to me. Uh, this is the uh, photo of someone who's uh, clearly very much in command of herself uh, and who, who knows what she's about. Uh, and uh, that is the Emily Dickinson that, uh, that uh, I believe in. One last question. In, in, in this journey that you have uh, now completed in writing this biography of Emily Dickinson. Is there one thing in particular that stands out that you learned that was a surprise to you about her? Well, there were a lot of details uh, but I, uh, that, that, that emerged in the course of my work. But that's not what you're asking about. Was there one big thing that surprised me? Uh, and I would say this. When I went into this project, uh, I think I think I had a lurking fear 
that this writer might turn out to be somewhat ditzy or fey or something of that sort, a, a lurking fear. And uh, the, the longer I worked, the, uh, the more relieved I felt uh, to have been absolutely wrong about that. There is an, an enormous strength in this writer. Her comment about uh, the strange strength of Emily Bronte or the biography of her uh, sums that up in many ways. Uh, and another thing that summed that up for me was a passage that, uh, that Dickinson wrote early on during the, uh, during the Civil War. And I want to see if I can find that uh, quickly. I'm not sure I can. Uh, it's a passage in which she speaks of how the war uh, is in some way inspiring her. Uh, and it's one that sums up uh, a motive, an impetus in her writing uh, in the early uh, 60s and uh, in, the, in the middle of the Civil War. This is a passage from a, a letter that uh, her, her, uh, her, earlier le her earlier editor, Thomas H. Johnson, dated in 1864 without really having uh, a, a very good basis. J. Lida, uh, in 1960, found a very good reason for placing this passage in 1862, much earlier in the war. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. And, and this, is, this, is really, uh, this really sums up my answer to this question. It's something that Dickinson wrote about the war uh, fairly early on and about the connection between the war and her own work. Sorrow seems more general than it did and not the estate of a few persons since the war began. And if the anguish of others helped one with one's own, now would be many medicines. This passage, there's more, but this passage connects her anguish, anguish with a collective anguish. I noticed that Robert Browning had made another poem and was astonished till I remembered that I myself, in my smaller way, sang off charnel steps. Every day feels life, every day life feels mightier, and what we have the power to be more stupendous. It's quite a remarkable passage, uh, and it makes the connection, and this is one I hadn't realized before I got to work, between her private anguish and collective trouble, and helps explain why she speaks to others and why she wasn't just writing for herself. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred Habiger. You've been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum, a free public forum in Harvard Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Sheraton Commander Hotel, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For an audio cassette of this program entitled The Secret Life of Emily Dickinson, featuring Alfred Habiger, recorded in October 2002, send a check or money order for $12 to Cambridge Forum at 3 Church Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138, or visit us on the web at www.cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Jamie Paglia. Thank you for joining us.